So hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar with E3 Security, how to slash incidents by 90% with XGen SOAR. My name is Alex McLaughlin. I'm the marketing director here at D3. I'll be working behind the scenes today uh, to assist Tom and to assist any attendees who have issues or questions. I'll also set up the on-demand version and get that out to, uh, to everybody um, after the presentation. So <clears throat> if, uh, if you do have a question, um, and I hope you have lots, please ask them via the chat box. We'll address them at the end of the Ask Anything uh, or at the Ask Anything session at the end. And uh, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thing. So um, my name is Thomas Byrne. We go by Tom, it's just easier. Uh, I spent the last few years working in cybersecurity as a security engineer in uh, Dublin, Ireland, working for a company in the States. Um, recently, I've transitioned in a move from Dublin to Vancouver, Canada to work as a sound engineer with D3. And for the last uh, how many months, been working with uh, D3 to bring the next gen SOAR to the wider audience, demonstrating our capabilities and bring automation to the cybersecurity industry and helping alleviate a lot of the issues we're seeing with um, lack of staff and training and uh, you know overabundance of alerts. So, looking forward to demonstrating to you guys today. And there's a small audience here today, but you know, just, we still kind of get in depth and kind of ask a lot of questions between us. So feel free to reach out and uh, ask some questions. Uh, thanks, Tom. So for the agenda, I'm going to briefly touch on the considerable challenges faced by security and our IR teams. We'll also cover the main reason we're all here, the automation strategy and SOAR platform that has reduced event volumes by 90% for some of our clients. We realize that's a bold claim. We need to explain what's behind it. So that's you know what we'll do today. So you know, in doing so, you'll learn about our platform and what we call the event pipeline. Um, you know, what, what everybody needs to know is D3 is an automation platform that helps security teams eliminate false positives and respond to confirmed threats. Uh, and this is critical because security is still hard. Um, it always has been. There are not enough people, not enough skills in the marketplace. Uh, tooling needs to be improved. Uh, and it's resulting in a supremely high false positive rate. It's burning SOC analysts out. Uh, it's allowing sophisticated attackers to slip by, you know, undetected or underdetected, uh, you know, thanks to the chaos and, and lack of context um, that they're dealing with. So, you know, in this environment, you really need to choose your tools wisely. You need to choose tools that make your team and your infrastructure as powerful and as efficient as possible. So, that's really the only way to succeed. And that's what D3 does. That's why we've been successful. We're laser focused on eliminating the noise and the busy work related to false positives. Uh, we also offer you know, the easiest automation in the market, codeless playbooks that empower analysts and hunters and, and don't require software engineers. So um, you're really empowering security uh, professionals uh, in the SOC to, to use automation, to, to do things on the front lines rather than, you know, waiting for software engineers, waiting for playbook edits. Uh, you know, that, 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 that time is just untenable in, in a real world situation. You know, D3 is also extremely comprehensive. We have a SOC dashboard, playbook editor, case management, reporting and analytics, and a MITRE attack monitoring module, all in one beautifully integrated and intuitive platform. And, and so I look forward to, uh, having Tom show you that today. Um, move on here. You know, we also are a vendor agnostic company. We have, uh, you know, 500 plus integrations across, I think like 380 vendors. Uh, so, you know, we offer high quality integrations. You can rely on D3 for top quality integrations kept up to date. And, and that's largely because we are totally focused on SOAR. We don't have other product lines to sell. All we care about is making sure our SOAR tool uh, can give you the integrations, playbooks, case management, um, you know, enrichment capabilities that, that you need to be efficient. Um, and, and, you know, that's extremely important to our success. Uh, a little bit about our customers. Uh, it, it's a wide range. We certainly have mega enterprise customers. So these are, you know, multiple Fortune 10s, numerous Fortune 500s. Um, they are across every global region and, and, and every, um, 
industry. I, I think it's a testament to you know how widespread you know issues like fishing are, where you know every industry is affected, and, and virtually every size of company is affected. Um, and obviously, we're we're working with lots of MSSPs and MDR providers uh, who use D3 to deliver and optimize their services through D3. And just an interesting you know tidbit that I like to to talk about is that 40% uh, of our customers replaced an existing SOAR tool with D3 in, in 2021. So, um, you know, I think that says a lot. It says that, you know, SOAR has been adopted um, largely, but it also means that, that people are unhappy with a lot of the tools that they selected. And they're increasingly turning to D3 because of its intuitiveness, because of its comprehensiveness, and, and you know, our ability to, to deal with large volumes and, and, and scalability. Um, and lots of playbooks. Uh, so, so, you know, that's where we're seeing some success in the market. And we have a special program in place uh, that makes it easy to switch from one SOAR tool or another to D3. So that's something we can talk about uh, as well. So, you know, the reason we're all here is because of this 90% reduction in events. And, and a little bit more about that before I pass it over to Tom. Uh, you know, many of our customers have used D3 and its event pipeline approach to reduce assigned events by 90%. It means that all false positives are taken care of prior to hitting a security team. It's not clogging up queues. Uh, and then many of the confirmed incidents are also managed with, you know, full automation or partial automation. And it's driving incredible reductions in, you know, the assigned events that are actually hitting your security team. Um, you know, one customer um, said that a, a full-time SOC analyst can do in 40 minutes using D3 what used to take seven hours. So basically, you take a full SOC shift or what used to be a full shift, you get all that done in, in less than an hour using D3. So, you know, what does that result in? It's a greater focus on threat hunting, more um, upskilling of analysts, more content development. Like overall, you're, you're giving your SOC team a more proactive approach uh, rather than one uh, that is reactive. So, you know, that, that's really important when we're dealing with, um, you know, some of the things that are happening this week and, um, you know, these, these uh, avalanches of, of security incidents and events that, that, you know, come in on a regular basis and then obviously are increased times like now, you need all hands on deck. You can't have people sifting through um, pointless alerts or, or benign events. And, and, and that's what D3 offers people is, is the ability to reduce the events assigned dramatically to your security team so that you can upskill them and become more proactive. Um, so this is a slide that, that Tom likes to lead with uh, into his uh, demo of the tool. So I'll let Tom you know, explain what we call the event pipeline that's been highly successful. And uh, so Tom, I'll let you take it from here. Sure thing. Thanks very much for that. So the event pipeline essentially describes our philosophy in handling the ingestion of alerts and how we run our correlation and our artifact enrichment and map that to the, basically reducing your false positive rates and improving your actionability and effectiveness when it comes to your overall um you know, day-to-day -day workflows. A lot of the problems we see with our clients that we onboard and people that we talk to throughout our discovery calls and a lot of problems in the industry boil down to issues that can be easily resolved by having these um, initial alerts triage using automation and uh, basic level triaging just to kind of weed out the false positives and focus on the true positive alerts. And how that looks effectively is we will handle um, alerts in D3 to two stages. We'll have our initial event ingestion and then we'll have the uh, incident level uh, events. So everything will eventually will, will come in as an event and then it will come through the data ingestion and, into the, and then go through the queue into the normalization. From here, we're, we're extracting our field mappings, we're extracting the relevant data and we're looking to again create a uh, search criteria for event correlation. We're doing to go some CMB, uh, CMDB lookups with our data lake. We're then going to do some threat out Intel data enrichment. We're going to do a little bit of a, a discovery into what this incident is. Is there any other um, 
similar events that are happening with all your different tools and uh, that are available to you. So for instance, a phishing email might have multiple different alerts that come with a phishing email, but it also might come with an EDR alert too, or maybe a firewall alert or what have you. So we're looking for those cross uh, correlation events. I'm basically going to be able to sew them together into one escalation up to a true positive incident. And the incident is where you have the true positives that are investigated by your tier twos, tier threes. And from there, they can use more advanced complex playbooks to be able to um, do their initial analysis and remediation. But what's important is at the event level, at the event pipeline, we're able to weed out a lot of those false positives. And as Alex alluded to there, we have many case studies and examples of when clients have been able to use this event pipeline to free up space for, for their analysts to complete much more tasks. And for anybody in the MSSB space here, that's very important because, you know, particularly what it could do for you is can, it, can, F, it can elevate your company and your capabilities to that of an MD MDR tool and an MDR um, you know space, which is which is becoming the new kind of area that the MSSPs will have to move into in this ever growing industry. It's something that we're quite proud of that we've been able to implement. We have uh, have glowing reviews from some of our most uh, high ranking clients. Uh, we've gotten great reviews from many of the independent vendors about this sort of thing. So Gartner, uh, Carpenter Co have rated this very highly. So. We've had a lot of validation in that field as well and a lot of confidence from our clients about how this works. And we feel like we can show that to our demo and show the kind of philosophy behind that. And throughout this series that we're developing, me and Alex, we'll be able to go into more depth about each part of this um, event pipeline and be able to show you the, the real uh, true value of it as well. So go ahead, Alex, you can skip on. So Tom, uh, you know, I'll let you uh, take it over from here. This was uh, this was the last of my slides, so I'm going to stop sharing. Pass it over to you. Perfect. So I believe we have about four attendees today. I, I, we were expecting about 25, but obviously with current events going on, we, we're, we're, uh, we're just glad to have some people in here. <laughs> I imagine everyone is pretty busy at the moment, so glad you're all here, guys. Uh, Seeing as it is a small group, and I probably will have a bit more time to go through a lot of this, uh, the product itself and answer a few of your questions. So I think while we're going through this, I know Williams asked a couple of questions. I have no problem taking any questions from the group, seeing as we have a small group here today. Um, what I'll initially do is I'm just going to check here. Can we all see my screen? We can all see my event dashboard, my investigation dashboard here. Yes? Yeah. Perfect. I'll pull up the chat here on the side as well. So what I'll do today is show you the building blocks of D3, what makes us the next generation SOAR, what makes us the big powerhouse in the industry that we're becoming, what's getting us more recognition and more approval from our uh, you know, independent uh, analysts and vendors and such. I'll, sh I'll walk you through what makes our, our feature sets quite um, you know, advanced in this field. I will talk a bit, a bit more about some technical questions that I've seen in the chat from William and maybe some other guys, if you want to ask some questions, feel free to fire them in as well. And then we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end just to ask some questions. So what D3 uh, philosophy when it comes to ingestion and the event pipeline starts here at the investigations dashboard. This is where we have the initial landing page of the events and where we can have uh, automated event playbooks with uh, automation rules in order to escalate things to uh, true positive incidences. I want to walk you through a manual process of how this looks to get an idea of how it looks behind the scenes. And we can talk through how we do our artifact enrichment and our uh, event correlation from a manual perspective. But I just want you guys to keep in mind this can all be done on a manual basis. We'll then move on to the configuration side of things where we look at how we can generate playbooks and then we can look at how we work with our integrations. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about the MITRE ATT&CK framework um, and then we can talk about how that kind of uh, integrates with our events and our incidences and then we can go to the reporting analytics which is quite important and uh, with all um, security monitoring tools. Uh, anybody who is interested in multi-tenancy is a very, very highly capable tool for multi-tenancy and um, we can speak a bit more to that if you'd like. Um, but for now I'm going to go into a, an incident and we're going to talk about how T3 handles it from that perspective. So as an example here, I'm going to use a phishing uh, use case just to demo how we ingest alerts and what we do with them in order to make uh, it more visible for the investigator to see how it works. So I click into this one here and I'll pull into the event log. This is obviously the raw log that anyone would see if they were using a SIM or whatever. This is what they'd initially see where we pull all our field mappings out of. So everything that comes into D3 is uh, formatted into a JSON format use that as our basis for most of our data formatting and our, our kind of normalization. And we'll basically use uh, field mapping extractions 
using data, using um, JSON to populate the overview section with uh, all your different artifacts and uh, all the different uh, files you need to do your initial triaging. And from here, you can see you get your um, your URLs, your your file names, and such. From here, you can make some sort of decisions into what's going on. Maybe you might recognize some names. You can leave some notes. You can escalate the incident if you'd like. Where things become a bit more complex and where you want to be looking as, as an investigator is the artifact behavior portion. This is an overall mapping schema of the event itself using some of the field mappings as markers to create this uh, field mapping here. So as you can see, the uh, risky artifacts here on the right are based off of the artifacts that they were passed out under. So you can see the URL here for the um, uh, URL you can see in front of you. So it's using that tag to be able to run the check within the artifact en en enrichment portion. So if I come to the file as well here, the target file is obviously a dummy file we use for testing, but I was gonna show you how we can do our artifact enrichment from this point. As you can see here, the reputation has been checked using virus total, but you can actually use whatever um, open source threat intelligence tool you'd like. All you have to do to configure this is very simply come to your configurations, come to your connections. And if I type in virus total or recorded future, sorry. All I have to do is recognize that as the uh, integration I'd like to use for these reputational checks. So it's very malleable in that regard. So if you'd like to use um, recorded future McAfee, you can all just trigger that from in here as well. And uh, this will give you more information about the um, the um, the file itself. And this is where we use it in the event pipeline to automate the escalations. So we're basically using this capability in order to escalate out the um, event into a true positive incident itself. Our in event and incident correlation, these are uh, automated uh, generated uh, searches based on the artifacts from the um, file, from the event itself. This looks for any other incidences that contain the similar artifacts in order to have a large scale escalation. A very good example of this is uh, obviously a phishing use case where you have mass amount of alerts firing from multiple different uh, uh, campaigns. And what you can do in this instance is escalate them all into one incident. And then escalate it off into the to the same to the same incident. Uh, let's see from the chat here what database is it built on. We can go into that in more detail at the moment. But if you're hitting any uh, log four J uh, uh, queries, uh, we've been totally cleared by Microsoft uh, in that regards. We were based our SaaS platform off as Azure, and uh, we've been cleared for any um, issues. Also, our back end is has nothing to do with log four J as well, so we're completely clear in that aspect. I should also mention here at the bottom. As uh, you might have seen, we do have a um, integration with MITRE, the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And the way we use that is very simply is we can create um, expect, extracted technique patterns based on event criteria in order to tag it for future or past incidences. We also can just automate automatically assign a tactical technique based off the incident itself. So you can see here in this condition, the URL uh, artifact um, of pool minor gate.com will trigger uh, for any future events um, as a true positive incident. And then we also check for any past incidences as well and I'll map that back to a dashboard we can look at later. So moving on from here, we'll have a look at what the escalation piece looks like. Um, as I said, bear in mind, this can all be done automatically as well through event level playbooks and automation rules. So from here, you sign out an incident type, which is very important, and I'll explain why later. And then from here, you can also then sign severities, uh, have an automate a default playbook, and then look at to assign an incident owner as well. So from then on, what you can do is, if you'd like, when you're working in a in, in, on your own uh, dashboard, you can create your own uh, viewpoints of the event dashboard itself on the left hand side here, in order to kind of get a better view into the different filters you'd like. And from here, then once that's complete and you've done your escalation piece, you may move on to the incidents portion. So the incident portion, as I said, these are the escalated true positive events that um, have been triaged enough that they've actually been sent up to a tier two, tier three. And this is where you'll have the full on uh, actionable capabilities of the playbooks themselves available to you. So I'll pop into one pre-made one here. And what I'm going to do is on the, on the right hand side, I'll actually open up the playbook that we're going to use. But for the moment, I'll just explain what we're looking at here. So this is the kind of case management piece of D3. So 
source solutions obviously encompass orchestration event correlation and case management and this is you know something that we've been you know quite known for is that we have comprehensive case management when it comes to dealing with these incidences and how that looks essentially is as i mentioned before the incident type is very important and why that's important is because it actually lays out the formatting for the incident overview section itself Everything up here would typically say will always stay the same. You'll have the same summary investigation team, linked instances, files, notes, tactics, and techniques, playbooks, and descriptions. They all stay the same. The other things that the things that would change per incident type will always be the dynamic fields here at the bottom. Now, the dynamic fields are um, unique to every incident type. So if you have you know multiple different incident types, they'll have different feature sets and different uh, event details artifact enrichment portions and such like that. And even in here, you can also define workflows. So you can actually define uh, work that needs to be completed by the investigators in order to make sure that they're actually doing the proper job. So if I pop into this dynamic field here, you'll see that the user is required to complete these tasks in order to actually close the incident out. So for audit sake, post incidents and debrief, you can actually see what they did and what they said they actually completed. So you see, you can fill out some incident notes, you can fill out some documentation, you can have multiple different formats for checking off, check boxes and uh, other note fields. We'll go back to the top here and we'll look at the investigations team. So you have an initial investigator that you will have. And what you can also do as well is assign out read only access to certain investigators. This is important when dealing with uh, training purposes, but it's also important if you want to just add maybe a shift lead, or maybe if you're an MSSP and you want to add someone from your client side, you can add them into a client side read only access to you as well. Then we have our linked incidences. Our linked incidences, obviously for contextual reasons, is when we want any historical incidences to give more kind of context and feedback to what you're actually dealing with at the moment. Your files are for any um, reports that you might get back from open source threat intelligence tools or any kind of uh, incident response plans or any kind of workflow diagrams or um, KB knowledge base articles you need to use. Your notes section is any notes updated by the system or updated by the um, user themselves. And these are uneditable. And as I said, at the bottom here, we have our event details, our dynamic fields that are used to be populated not only by the user manually, but also by the playbooks automatically. So you can see here in this portion, we have the uh, artifact types that were used and checked using this playbook. And we can see here that the reputation checks that they received back based on these artifact values from these reputational sources as popped back into this field here. We also have ways of uh, analyzing the uh, investigators, mean time to response, mean time to analyze, and mean time to escalate. And all that information can be pre-populated into the incident as well. So we'll look a bit more here at the top. I want to see this is a create a task portion. This is for when you need to delegate out actions to be completed by multiple different people within the organization. So say, for instance, um, you need someone to go to the server room and shut off a bunch of servers because you're afraid a, mal a ransomware attack is about to happen and you want to message the one quick, the quickest runner in the, in, in the SOC. You can create a task for that per person to complete, give it a task name, give it an ad hoc type, and then send out a message or an email to that user. Uh, and you can actually assign SLAs and to this as well. So they can actually see if it's overdue or not. We also have export functions for um, incident uh, executive summaries for debrief and uh, post incident analysis. We also have an execute command function then here. This is utilizing all our integrations in order to complete certain actions uh, ad hoc on an ad hoc basis. So for instance, say I want to run a quick command within my SIM tool to be complete a search. So say if something pops up that I haven't seen before, let's say I want to use Splunk in order to just run a quick search. I can go from here, click the connector that I have to set up a search and run the search time, the search in here and actually get a result back. We also have a, an internal messaging system here at the bottom. We can use this to send messages to our other investigators. And they will get that pop up in their own um, viewpoint as well. And then we'll move on to the events and incidences and playbooks here on the left. Uh, I just want to check the questions. Is your database already available? I have to get back to you on that one, William. Um, so moving on here, I'll go to go show you one of the playbooks that we're using. So I'll actually open it up on the incident space, but I'll also open it up on the configuration side of things as well. So this is the configurations page. 
this is one of our big new designs we've pushed through in our version 14. Uh, we're actually working on another big improvement to the uh, version itself, which includes a data lake and a few other um, um, niceties as well for the UI. Uh, we'll have a look at the playbook we're using at the moment. So. So I'll open up the configuration page as well as the incident page. So this is the configuration of the same play but that's, in, that's in this incident here. So uh, the philosophy obviously with playbooks changes per company to company, but usually follows the same flow. And um, that usually goes from initial ingestion uh, of uh, art artifacts and um, then it comes to analysis of those artifacts, then decision-making in those artifacts, then either remediation or a response is sent to the client or response is taken by a, an external investigator. So how that looks um, in a playbook essentially is looks like a use case diagram or workflow diagram. I'm pretty sure we've all seen these before within our, our computer science degrees that we've probably all got or maybe we've worked with before. Um, but essentially it, it is a, it's, all the mundane repeatable tasks that we would complete in a normal triaging fashion done via playbook. So you can see here the initial uh, kicking off of the playbook and have our stage task portion here. So there's actual visual cues within the uh, playbooks themselves. So we can look at this here. This is a stage task here at the bottom. This one here. It then moves on to um, the analysis portion. So what we'll do is we're going to focus on the same event that we we're looking at from the start. So we'll actually pull back up that raw event log here. So here's the raw event log we were looking at earlier is a random phishing event alert, and it's got multiple different attributes. It's got a file hash, a file name. It has a URL and a few other artifacts we can check. So we'll pop back to the configuration side of things just to show you what that looks like from this side. So you can see here at the top, we have our attachment uh, sandbox reputational check. We then are going to go check to see if there's any external IPs within the network. And we actually do this check by using global lists. You know, global list is just a static JSON list of information. So you can, you can basically house anything in there from host names to sub, subnets or whatever you need. So you can actually do that reputational check from in here. You can check the email authenticity here and then just make sure the header is the same as the body. And then you also want to run a check on the URL within the, um, within the uh, event itself. So we'll pop back into the uh, incident here and see what that looks like. So we can see here, we go to check what this module has done. We can see it's taken the file name from the event log. And that's the result it's given it. It's given it the hash file and said the risk level is very high. That immediately will then inform the next um, module here, which is a conditional task. This is the decision maker throughout the playbook that we have plotted along all the different event streams to make decisions on what to do next. If it turned out to be benign, then surely we just skip to the next step and either close out the incident. And if it is, we'll actually make decisions of whether or not we want to take any remedi remediation steps as well. So we can see you want to check for any reputational checks on the IP addresses, see if there's anything outside of our own subnet involved here that we might need to check for. And if it is, obviously we want to maybe take some action. So we talk to a lot of our clients about their overall infrastructure. What is their um, kind of use case for SOAR? What, what, what are they looking to achieve? And how do they achieve that with the current tools they have? And how do they interact with the rest of the teams they have? Because not all security teams have access to all the tools they could use throughout their workflow. So for example, firewalls uh, would be one of them that sometimes we, we work with teams that don't actually have um, direct access to those firewalls and have to work with the a knock team in order to complete actions like blocking IP addresses or configuring certain ACLs or whatever it is. Um, the interaction task here, which is the, um, the uh, purple, it looks purple enough to me, I've, I've heard it's turquoise <laughs> button here. And this is a, basically a call for request of approval or for information from a user and why that's important is because you know security is a team game and you know you're dealing with multiple different teams at a time not just a security team and you need to be able to you encompass that in within your playbooks and your workflows and what this will do is it will send a request out to that team for approval via email we'll just send them a link with a dropbox saying 
I need to request to block this IP address. Yes or no. Have you completed this task? And that will create a pending task here within the pending task portion. So once that's set out, a timer is set for however long you set it for, maybe an hour, 30 minutes, and that's then ready to be completed. And once that's completed, it will move on with the rest of the playbook. If not, and you're given approval, um, rather than action, well, uh, if the approval is given and to give the action, uh, uh, the approval for the playbook, rather than the action being completed by the um, other member, it will go ahead and just do the um, block itself. Then moving down to the email authenticity check, we have utility commands that actually do this itself, embedded in the tool that can actually do this for you. And then we also have for the URLs, we have a int integration with URL to ping just to give us a quick screenshot of the integration itself, uh, of the uh, URL itself. So you can see here it's picked up this URL and you can see here something's happened. The result is blank. There's nothing here. So Another key feature of version 14 that we had released was the ability to test functionalities of each module within a playbook. It's become one of the big, you know, demoing points to a lot of our clients when they deal with SOAR tools or security tools that build these sort of automation features. They don't get a lot of in the ways of testing. They don't get a lot of the ways of doing pre-production testing. Um, they might get a, um, a development environment and a prod environment, which they do get with D3, but they might not be able to get, you know, the best amount of uh, testing with that. So we have a testing feature here at the top. This will run the playbook against a past incident of the same incident type you're looking to, to work on. So we can actually click on this here and then run a test on it. If you want to as well, we can also just come into the configuration tab, go look at the integration we're looking to test. So say it was URL to ping, PNG. And we go to this integration URL, the, the integration module we're using, and we want to test it. And we simply have to do is test the command. It will give us back a response. We can actually see what's going wrong. So it might actually tell us hey, the integration is broken, or it maybe give you some other error as well. But you have the ability to do that within the playbook itself. So if I go to here, I'm going to run it. You can see here. I think it's actually been a bit slow today. Yeah, so we can actually do live testing of the um, modules we're using throughout the playbooks. So we can see here, we go to the sandboxing tool. So we get a result. Yeah, so we can basically run testing on all the different modules we have available within the playbook as we develop it, which is a good key feature to have with developing out the playbooks. Um, from here, once we do our initial analysis, we do our uh, conditional, uh, conditional tasks um, and decision making, we then move on with the remediation step. Now, this is the point that typically a lot of SOCs might either pause on if they're doing um, managed servicing or if they're doing, if they need to um, you know, take action, they'll eventually stop at, post, at, at analysis and then look to do the manual remediation themselves. And that's the one thing that D3 can do for you is it can make your MSSP or make your team more proactive with using all the tools you have available to you to be more of a remediation team uh, as well. So we have the capabilities of using what's available to you to be able to run the remediation. So you can see here, once they have actually considered the, um, the attachment file to be malicious, they can start to quarantine the hosts that have been involved with this incident. They can search for other hosts that have been involved with this situation. So if, uh, if it's a widespread incident, they can get the host names and start using maybe Sentinel-1 or whatever EDR tool you're using to quarantine those hosts. Uh, but also in the meantime, we want to make sure that we're updating you know, our ticketing systems or using emails to update the, your team. So we have email functionality with D3 where you can actually encompass all the artifacts and information from the event into one uh, email and then send that information out to a shift lead or whomever it may concern with all the relevant artifacts about what's going on. We also have really good integrations with Teams, Slack, and a bunch of other um, non-security tools in order to make sure that we have the full coverage of the, uh, the, uh, the incident response workflow to make sure that we're encompassing all that aspect of it. So as I said, once we're doing all these actions, we want to make sure that we're keeping that up to, up to date with everybody involved. But we're quarantining the hosts um, using um, whatever EDR solutions or whatever tools are available to you. And see in this instance here, I believe they're using Sentinel-1. 
or McAfee in this instance. But it, I want to make sure that you guys understand it's very simple and very easy to create these playbooks. And later on throughout this series, we will be making our own playbooks as a team and we'll maybe offer up a situation and maybe recreate these playbooks on the fly as we go through it. So say we don't know use this one, we want to maybe use a central one integration. I'll just click on this here. So we want to quarantine host. Like spell quarantine. <laughs> Uh, let's say we'll use Sentinel one. All I have to do is just drag and drop it into here. And then we just need to set the parameters here. So if I'm using it dynamically, I want to go to the data source incident and let's see event. Uh, say for instance, I want to use maybe an email address just as an example here, we can click, say this person's email address, we want to be able to quarantine the host that's associated with it. We can just simply add it by doing it without any code involved. It's very easy to configure within D3 as well. And from here, once this is completed and you've done your remediation steps, you can do some post um, incident analysis, maybe check for any other further situations where this happened in the past, or running some searches on the IPs that were involved, and then maybe create an executive summary of the situation as well. So it's very dynamic, very easy to configure, no code involved here at all. If you're uh, anyway inclined to create any Python scripts or any queries you'd like with your integrations, that's all available within D3. We do have a custom, we do have a Python IDE available within the system itself that you can complete. Um, so as the investigator, how does this improve your overall kind of workflows? Well, it makes you more efficient and it makes you more responsive to your actions. Um, for anybody in here who's kind of worried about over automating things, there is a lot of checks and balances that can be completed here. Let's say, for instance, we come back to this quarantine host um, configuration. It's not set to run automatically. We can actually wait, ask for approval to complete these tasks as well, just to the investigator. So you can see here, there's also the pending tasks portion. So you can see here, there's a lot to be completed by the investigator simply just to give approval or maybe to offer, um, I don't know, uh, you know, some of their own and capabilities in terms of ways of, of um, running checks themselves. So that capability will always be there. We don't want to make sure, we don't want to cut out the man uh, in the middle, uh, in a sense. Um, so that's all available to you uh, within D3. Another thing we have here for audit reasons is obviously the command center. So anybody worried about keeping things uh, logged, it's all be seen here within the command center. So I, this has just been a taster of what we can see within the incident overview tab with the playbooks. Um, do look forward to the rest of this series that me and Alex will be running over the next six months to see more in the way of developing our playbooks and uh, testing and everything like that. We'll have a whole uh, webinar that developed into this. Uh, but for now, I'm going to bounce back to the event dashboard and we're going to talk about MITRE ATT&CK. We're going to talk about how we use MITRE ATT&CK um, to operationalize the, the use case of it for the benefit of viewing your overall security posture as a, as a team. And what I mean by that is using that data to make decisions as a team of where you want to see improvements, where you're seeing most of your attacks come from. So initially, I'm just going to show you how it's done from the event level and the incident level, and then we'll talk about how that's mapped to a dashboard. So if you come down to the bottom of the same incident we were talking about earlier, you can see here, as I said, we have the URL equals um, minor.gate.com. And this is a uh, technique pattern that's being used to map this particular event as a under the reconnaissance tactic with the technique of phishing for information. What this will then do is map it back to this dashboard here. So this is the monitor dashboard here at the top. This monitor dashboard is basically your overall mapping schema of your entire security posture. If you use correctly, you can map every incident you've had in your environment to this because you can also create custom ones too. So I had a call earlier this morning and um, the client was basically asking, well, if I'm receiving logs, uh, I want to be able to tag it for certain use cases that are not within the modern attack framework. I want to be able to make my own custom ones. I said, perfectly. What we can do in this instance here is 
Uh, if you see a technique pattern, a pattern that you don't like within your system, you want to run some searches on it. Let's say, for example, the use case we're talking about there with the URL, I can create searches multiple different searches at once in one search. So say, for instance, that URL that we're talking about, we can add this in as a criteria for a search. And all I have to do is add a Boolean argument to it. So it contains such, and then we create another one and we create this kind of overall, um, you know, criteria or attributes of an event that have a particular event, uh, that have a particular, um, you know, tactic and technique and, for him, he was looking for do some threat hunting. He was looking for any past incidents that might have the same criteria as a new incident he's found. We can create these large scale searches. What they'll do is they'll go through all past events that you've seen within D3 and then map it back to this dashboard. So you have to view it from here as a as an overall arching kind of um, view of your environment. And what comes with the minor attack integration as well is the entire summary of the different tactics and techniques, the mitigation techniques, the type of detection uh, ways you can go about doing things, uh, groups that have used this particular tactic and technique and be able to use that information to then find software within your system. So it really offers up a lot of um, help in developing out your overall uh, threat hunting capabilities. So yeah, and this also then feeds into the incident page with all with pretty much as it escalates, it will all be parsed into the incident portion. And then we have our technique patterns here, as I mentioned before. So you can see here, URL is equal to such. We also then keep a database of all our uh, artifacts that have been seen. So remember I mentioned with the artifact behavior portion. So every file, URL, endpoint uh, can be all be housed in here for uh, further reference as a group. And a map overview as well. So we get a good map of where all the artifacts are coming from within your environment, probably somewhere over here, I'd imagine. Um, so from here, I'm going to move us on to reporting analytics, and then we'll round out the rest of this session. Uh, we'll just go to some um, questions and Q&As. I know William has some questions in the chat there I'm going to respond to. Um, so obviously, every security monitoring tool needs a good reporting analytics, a good robust reporting analytics portion. And this is something that you know we've, we're have we quite comfortable with and something we've been using for a while. Uh, we have multiple different dashboards you can create. The dashboards can all be moved around like widgets on a page. Uh, to create any new ones, you simply pop up over to the new report section over here. I will bring a pop-up. So I want to bring that pop-up into the dashboard. You can see here all the different reports you can run, anything from checking your own investigations teams, uh, mean time to response and analysis of your overall team, and also check out uh, maybe some uh, looks into your own uh, IR list as well. And then that basically you can map back to reporting analytics, and you can obviously have um, metrics on your team. So if I go to the data portion here, get to see a breakdown of your overall investigation team, how many events they have had open, how many they have closed. And that's all based off of pivoting off the different bits of information you have available to you. So this is where I'll leave it. Um, it as I said, this is more of an introductory to the, to the tool and give you a tease about what we're going to be doing over the next six months. We, myself, Alex, will be hosting one of these calls every month. We'll get to dive deeper into different portions of the tool. We'll develop our own playbooks. We'll look at our integrations and developing our own kind of integrations from there. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the, what I've shown you today. I will go to the Q&A here, uh, and we'll talk about that. Um, so, yeah, I, thanks for listening so far. And we're going to go to the Q&A section at the moment. You know, I, I just want to add one thing as Tom reads the questions and, and prepares his answer, and that is, um, yeah, so Tom and I are working on a webinar series that's going to, you know, take us through about halfway through the year. And it won't just be Tom and I, we're going to have special guests. For example, we have uh, Ali Mellon from Forrester who will be joining us uh, for our February um, uh, webinar. We have special guests from some of our uh, technology alliances who will be joining us. So, you know, we want to keep it um, sort of light and engaging and, and, you know, being able to talk about what's happening rather than being, you know, pinned into a specific agenda. And uh, so, you know, we really hope that we see the folks who attended this webinar to, in our future events, you know, it, it'll be different every time. Uh, it's not going to be the same thing over and over again. And, and you know, like security, our, our presentations are going to evolve to, to really address, um, you know, current events and, and the things we're doing with partners, whether it's customers, technology alliances, uh, maybe something that, you know, Gartner or Forrester uh, is, is talking about at the time. So 
um, you know, just wanted to mention that. So, so Tom, why don't you uh, go ahead? I'll mute myself here. Great. So I'll go to the questions really quick. But William, what's the database built on currently back in SQL and MongoDB? Is the database already configured? Uh, WRT named APTs dependencies. Yeah, I have to get back to that one actually. Uh, well, I have to get back to the infrastructure team on that one. What Python version? I believe it's the most up to date one. Python two. But one, isn't it? Yeah, I can't recall. Sorry, I haven't I haven't done Python since my thesis about four years ago. <laughs> um uh built uh, it's, we're using Azure so Windows. Um uh, yeah, thanks William for listening. It's been great chatting to you. Um guys, any other questions if you'd like to ask, please feel free to reach out now or via email. You should get a follow-up email with just maybe a debrief of the uh, webinar itself. So probably just don't don't think it's just yeah. marketing material. We're just going to send it out to everybody at the end. It's just a thanks for joining. Here's some more information, and the recording will be sent out too for obviously for anybody who missed it here today. So I know there's a lot of guys here from multiple from the same corporations and groups. So don't worry, they won't miss out on it. Um, yeah, I think seems like we're wrapping up here for yeah. um, so, people. So so yeah, every attendee who uh, showed up or, or you know folks who waited for the on demand version, they will receive that via email along with a follow up uh, from myself and uh, we will leave it at that. Thanks Tom, I think you did a great job and and thanks uh, William in particular for your questions. I think they were great. Jose, thanks as well. And uh, we'll leave it there and we'll see you next time in January and you'll all be getting an email about what we're doing in January. Okay, bye-bye. Just answer William's quick question. Uh, okay. yep. Meantime to installation. Great question because it, it changes all the time. <laughs> Large, medium, small, it changes every single time. I'm, I'm, I'm given new answers by how long it takes to integrate to, to install with different teams because... Um, it just depends on on the then the immediate impact of it. Like sometimes we've had customers go, we need something immediately. Here's here's a you know here's what we need. Let's just go for it right now. And we've been like, okay, grand. Uh, sometimes it's a very very long process. I mean, we one of our sales we wrapped up. I think it's been over a year and a half. Um, but just from sales cycle to initial implementation, and we're only getting to the implementation stage now because they had so many checks they had to complete themselves. So, in an in an, in a mean kind of give you an average of everything goes smoothly i think up and operational at full capacity within three months and uh, small medium and large organizations and a large organization probably is about the three month line um if there's an initial onboarding process that's pretty intense that comes with ample amount of training ample amount of work with uh one-on-one -on -one work with all our engineers because obviously everything we do is in-house everything everything it, it, that is done by d3 is done by d3 we don't have any outsourcing everything is done with in-house uh everybody is based in vancouver beside maybe two or three sales guys so we do kind of have a lot of focus here and we offer 24-hour support and a lot of our engineers uh, work around the clock to get you guys up and running we do kind of have out-of-the-box integrations out-of-the-box um playbooks sorry but it, they just changed so frequently became almost um kind of um, more work to reconfigure them. So the initial onboarding time takes um, um, quite a long just because we develop out the workflow playbooks with the team. Oh, instantly. I could do it right now. I could show you. So if, because all of, most of our, our connections are out of the box and even to do any custom ones takes little to no time at all. Like I've made plenty of custom ones in, in this tool, in this demo environment to do my own testing, but all you have to do is come to add integration. Um, do you want to give me a tool name, just any random tool name you might know, and we see if it will. So, so the question that Tom's strikers. addressing is what's the time to ingest a new security tool? So red, red seal, I don't forget red seal. I think he said that one on purpose because he knew it'd be hard. <laughs> uh, let's see. I just use CrowdStrike as an example. Um, let's see. CrowdStrike Falcon. All you have to do then is put in your API credentials and then there is a fetch event function ready for every single integration. So I do want to address this one. Sorry, Alex, I'm running a bit over here, but it is a good question. Um, all oh, our fine. integrations come with a fetch event of function already pre-made with um, field mappings ready to go. So say, so long as I say web API is enabled, easy. Yeah, exactly. So if I go to CrowdStrike Falcon, there's the, um, let's see, let's try to here. There's the fetch event. Every single integration comes with this fetch event function that has the field mappings already generated for you. So all these field mappings, make sure that it's parsed out easy. Done, two seconds. Takes no time. So 
Great question. So yeah, I think that wraps us up today, guys. So um, any more questions at all, feel free to direct towards my email, Alex's email, and we can follow up. If you'd like a further demo, more intimate demo with your team, please let us know. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us today. Cheers, William. Thanks, everyone.